Anderson, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Western Montana's Mental Health, a role that he assumed in 2018 following nearly 20 years in the medical device and pharmaceutical industries. Levi is certified in healthcare management uh, as a fellow in the American College of Healthcare Executives and has broad leadership experience in diversified healthcare environments. He is a two-time graduate of the Montana University system. And lucky for him, one of those degrees is in zoological studies, which is currently helping him with his middle school and two high school students, who he is so happy to be back in Missoula raising <laughs> in the last best place. Um, one of our other panelists, Dr. Sarah Potts, is a staff psychologist and director of behavioral health at Partnership Health Center in Missoula. She graduated with her PhD in clinical counseling and psychology from Utah State University. She specializes in behavioral pediatrics in her residency and postdoctoral fellowship at the Boys Town Center for Behavioral Health in Omaha, Nebraska. She is passionate about working with children and families with a variety of emotional and behavioral concerns, medical co-diagnosis, and family challenges. She specializes in parent training support, mindfulness, self-compassion, applied behavioral interventions, acceptance and commitment therapy, and pediatric assessment. She has a particular interest in improving access and quality of behavioral health services in rural and underserved areas through training, outreach, clinical analytics, and telehealth. She is also, of course, a niece to the very famous Mrs. Potts from Beauty and the Beast. But no, she cannot get you a, a, um, a meeting with her. I already tried. And of course, uh, our last but not least panelist, Rob Watson. He was named Montana's Superintendent of the Year in 2019. And we are so honored to have him serving as our Superintendent of Missoula County Public Schools currently. Rob has a bachelor's degree in secondary education from Montana State University, a master's degree in educational leadership from the University of Alaska, and received his doctorate degree in educational leadership from the University of Montana. Currently, Rob is a member of the Certif Certification Standards and Practices Advisory Council for the Montana Board of Public Education. Rob also has experience as board member on several local organizations, the Bozeman Public Library Foundation, Bozeman Deaconess Hospital, and Greater Gallatin United Way. Rob believes that providing positive leadership for the local education community is important in creating opportunities to help all students succeed. And rumor has it, although he was superintendent of the year last year, he has already been nominated for best hair out of all the superintendents this year. So Missoula, let's keep him under stressed so he can keep all those lovely locks. We're, vote we're hoping for you, <laughs> Rob. All right. So we're going to start out today. Um, each one of our panelists will have a few minutes to share a little bit about their organization. And we're going to open it with one of our questions. I could see my child running through the background. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I'll ask them all a question and we'll take a little bit of time. We'll start with Levi and then go to Dr. Potts and then on to Rob Watson. Uh, our first question that we're going to ask um, is about self-care. Of course, self-care and connection are so important during this pandemic. What have you been doing to take care of your mental health? And who is someone that you have been connected with there during this time? I'm gonna turn it over to Levi to start. Thank you, Rosie, I appreciate it. Uh, I, I also wanna uh, thank Susan and City Club Missoula for inviting me to be a part of this session. Uh, this conversation is extremely important to our community, so I'm happy to be here and, and support it. Um, it, it. In terms of self-care, I think we all, uh, you know, think of self-care as uh, things that help us alleviate stress uh, from our daily lives, whether it's related to uh, recreational activities or otherwise. And um, like many Missoulians, uh, I find uh, great stress relief in the outdoors. Uh, so I've taken uh, many of these sunny days when I have time available to get outside, go on hikes, and uh, spend time with my family. And for me, that's uh, some of the best self-care that, that I can have. So I, I appreciate that. 
I'd like to say thank you as well, Rosie, and that was a fun intro. <laughs> Um, I, I have spent a lot of time uh, trying to have a better balance between life and work, and I think I could spend 60-plus hours every week working in some capacity, and I just have felt that it's so important to have, have that balance and leave my computer and shut my computer down for at least 24 hours on the weekend. I, n I notice a difference in even my blood pressure, I think, <laughs> just completely unplugging. Um, I also got a puppy with my partner in the fall, and so we've been training her and doing all sorts of fun stuff on the river. And so that has been my, I guess my dog and the river have been my uh, main connection of self-care. I also have to say that it doesn't matter how long we take uh, in terms of practicing maybe a quick mindfulness exercise or just a connection to mind and body and self in a moment. Um, even walking through a hallway, sometimes a 60 second quick exercise, thinking of my feet on the ground, thinking of, of um, you know, maybe where I'm carrying any stress or tension in my body, even something as quick as that can be kind of helpful too. Rona, would you like to share with us? Yeah, it's uh Boy, it's a stressful time for all of us. I was just reflecting on an email that I am working on for our teaching staff. And one of the things we always encourage teachers to do in the summertime is, is take some time for rest and relaxation because we know that the pace of a school year can get, can get crazy for, for our staff. And while we all want to do that this summer, what I find is that we have this constant um, pressure related to the pandemic and it's really hard I find for for our staff and for myself to really find that time for rest and relaxation with this constant pressure of the unknown of the pandemic and it's always around us in our world so I know that's difficult to say that and to believe that of this summer but we've been talking to our staff about taking rest and relaxation the the thing that I have tried to do is to remain positive um, and that's very difficult on some days, as, as we can all imagine. But um, I try to start my day with a positive attitude every day. It's something that um, my parents told me a long time ago is you really can't control what other people do, but you can always control the attitude that you show up with. And, the, and that's what I try to do is remain positive. I also find that um, giving gratitude is really helpful in that. And uh, I try to make sure I do that on a daily basis because when you give gratitude, it not only helps the person that you're talking to, but it also helps you as an individual um, because you're, you're, you're giving gratitude, which makes you feel good. So I try to do a little bit of that every single day. We're excited to hear a little bit more about your each individual organization and recent experience. So, um, our next question, uh, and then feel free to talk a little bit more about your organization at the end of this question, um, and we'll go in the same order, uh, is how has your organization adapted during the pandemic? What have been the biggest challenges for you and the most positive changes? Levi? Thank you, Rosie. And I think I'll take this opportunity to uh, initiate my screen share and my slideshow because I, I, I will address some of those things um, throughout this presentation. Uh, have, have a few quick slides to share with everybody today. Um, as is the case with most nonprofit healthcare organizations, um, our, excuse me just for a sec. Our, uh, everything we do at Western Montana Mental Health Center starts uh, with our mission. Uh, we build thriving communities through compassionate, whole person, expert care. And we fulfill that mission by providing comprehensive behavioral health services uh, from more than 50 sites through 17 counties in Montana. Uh, so we have a, a fairly significant area in which we operate. Uh, and for those who are not familiar with uh, Montana geography, when I'm talking to folks from other areas, I always like to put the, the geography in which we operate in the context of the state of Pennsylvania, because the square mileage that we cover is roughly equivalent. Um, as I mentioned, comprehensive behavioral health services uh, refers to a continuum of care that is designed to meet the needs of individuals 
uh, across a broad spectrum of need and really meet those individual clients where they are and provide the right care at the right time in the right place. So as you can see on this slide, I've, I've tried to share a few of the programs that we operate uh, throughout our geography. Uh, and some of those programs are very well known, like here in Missoula, the flagship program is a program of the Western Montana Mental Health Center and one that we operate in uh, co collaboration uh, with MCPS and other school districts in this area. Uh, some of our other well-known programs would include Recovery Center, which is our inpatient substance use treatment facility. Uh, but then beyond that, we also operate a variety of other lesser known services. Uh, those services may involve assertive community treatment or a way for our staff to proactively engage clients in community and be present in community to provide services. Or on the other hand, some of our crisis intervention services uh, and having teams available both in community and in our stabilization facilities scattered throughout the region uh, to support individuals who are experiencing mental health emergency. I wanted to start by uh, ensuring that there was an understanding of the programming that we operate uh, because I felt it was important to understand all of those different programs uh, as it relates to the impact of COVID-19 on our operations. Um, so the next three slides really address the immediate impact of COVID on our agency and on our operations, uh, the lessons that we took away from that first six weeks and then really what we're projecting and what we're looking at towards the future as we continue to navigate COVID-19 uh, through an unknown period of time moving forward. I, I think uh, the first day that we really understood or, or began to understand the uh, incredible impact that COVID-19 would have on our operations uh, was uh, ironically St. Patrick's Day. Uh, the day before uh, St. Patrick's Day, uh, uh, we were addressing uh, an event that we have scheduled in Butte. And I'm sure many of you are aware that St. Patrick's Day in Butte is a very uh, special time. And, uh, we uh, have an annual event where we host over 100 clients and staff members uh, at our facility in Butte uh, for a lunch. Uh, and we understood at that time that that event was not going to be possible. Uh, all the recommendations at that point from the CDC were to limit gathering sizes, and we knew that we would have to not only uh, cancel that particular event, but really rethink how we dealt with a number of different services that we provide. So that led us, unfortunately, to have to suspend a number of different programs that uh, are built around the idea of group involvement and large group sizes. Beyond that, uh, we also operate a number of different group homes uh, for severely uh, disabled mental uh, clients experiencing severe disabling mental illness. Uh, and so uh, while many of us were struggling with a stay at home order and trying to social distance, that really uh, puts in a new context um, the impact on individuals who are living in a group home environment. So those, uh, those individuals and those environments were ones in which we had to deal with very specifically to try to keep them engaged with their normal activities, but also uh, uh, abide by the state home order and make sure that we were limiting risk uh, for disease transmission uh, for those individuals. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, we operate 24 seven crisis facilities, uh, crisis stabilization facilities in a number of our communities. So really it was uh, uh, an idea of trying to understand how we could still have individuals enter that care, enter that facility uh, and make sure that we were mitigating risk as best we could. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around personal protective equipment. Uh, and uh, we are a, a behavioral health agency, but we are not a standard hospital-based uh, uh, healthcare group that may have access to personal protective equipment. So uh, even the acquisition of PPE was a new thing for our organization, especially in the volumes that required for us to continue operating adequately. So that alone took several weeks. And then in addition to that, we had to create a variety of policy and procedure to ensure that our staff had proper guidance to use that PPE. And then of course, we had to transition to telehealth. Uh, within, uh, by the third week of March, we had approximately 80% of our staff working remotely. 
Uh, so we had to ensure that we had the technology available to them and to our clients uh, to be able to provide our services effectively. So what did we learn from that first six weeks? I think first and foremost, we learned that maintaining engagement with our clients and providing care appropriately takes more than just technology. Uh, there were a number of gaps that we had, and we really had to be creative and work collaboratively with different partners uh, to address some of those challenges. We're fortunate uh, uh, to have partners uh, like Blackfoot, who is sponsoring this event today, uh, to help us provide broadband to uh, areas in which some of our clients did not have that access. Uh, so for us to be able to use telehealth, we actually had to intervene and, and provide that service for some folks. And then uh, some of the services that we had to suspend uh, involve social interactions and involve engagement, personal connections that we really had to try to replicate uh, for the care environment to uh, be as close to normal as possible. That's been a significant challenge for us. Uh, but it's, uh, as, as much as we focus on our clients, it was also a struggle for our staff. Uh, so staffing during this time has been a significant challenge and we've learned that uh, staffing these types of services requires a lot of flexibility on everyone's part. Uh, we had to understand that there were uh, individual fears that were being faced for someone to come into the office or come into a clinical environment where they're providing care. We had to be, uh, we had to acknowledge those fears. Uh, and at the same time, uh, on the business side of our agency, uh, the vast majority of our folks were not reporting to a regular workspace. Uh, so we had to devise ways to maintain accountability through that remote work environment. And uh, finally, as a community service provider, it became critically important for us to communicate and communicate and communicate again. Uh, we reached out to a number of different partners and established ongoing communications and, and meetings and uh, really trying to do the best we can to have some awareness of the services that we have available uh, for all those in our community. And then finally, as we look towards the future, uh, some things that we're, we're learning and some things that we're projecting. Uh, number one, uh, we've always used telehealth, uh, but this crisis, this last four months, has allowed us to use telehealth in a brand new, expanded way. So telehealth is here to stay. I, I think for us to be most effective in this care environment, uh, we'll have to work with our legislators to make some changes on how we can improve access for rural communities. Uh, it's been critically important for us to have flexibility in uh, the use of telehealth and the use of uh, telephones to provide clinical uh, interventions. And that's something that we see as being very beneficial moving forward. Uh, those technologies also allow us to leverage our clinical staff across the entire geography that we, we cover. Uh, so now our clinicians who are here in Missoula can not only help our neighbors within Missoula City and within Missoula County, but also reach out to other areas like Mineral County and Lake County and Valley County, uh, where there may be needs as well. I can tell you the last four months, uh, we put a tremendous amount of work in our disaster preparedness plans. Uh, this is something that historically our agency has not had readily available or formalized in any significant way. Uh, so now our, our emergency response plans are much more robust. We've had to improve our supply chains so that we have access to PPE and other things needed uh, to ensure our services are up and running. And then finally, we were able to uh, implement surveillance testing and screening processes uh, so that we're uh, eliminating uh, risk or limiting risk of disease transmission as best we can. Uh, and that's critically important to us. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, I think many of us are seeing, and this is becoming a national conversation, that uh, our agency is preparing for an increased need of mental health services. We are, we are seeing a, a huge increase in the acuity of cases that we're treating in crisis as well as uh, the acuity of cases that we're treating in substance use uh, over the last several weeks. Uh, we anticipate that unfortunately this may continue uh, as social isolation and social distancing continue to be a, a major part of our lives. Uh, we're starting to see stresses throughout our communities that we're trying to uh, prepare for. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why uh, Western Montana Mental Health Center opened our behavioral health urgent care clinics uh, throughout a, a number of different areas, Missoula being one of them. 
Uh, we're committed to providing same day access to mental health services so that hopefully we can uh, intervene upstream and, and in advance of anyone truly experiencing a mental health emergency. Of course, we have crisis services, uh, but it's in everyone's best interest if we can intervene at an earlier time and do some prevention work with those individuals. So thank you for your time, and I'll uh, stop my screen share. Thank you, Levi. It, and um, being on the committee for the Mental and Behavioral Health Task Force with COAD, uh, I was really impressed to watch how quickly the behavioral and mental health urgent care that you guys created was up and running um, after the pandemic started. It was it was really amazing to watch all your employees come together with the whole community and be a part of that. So thank you again. And could you just touch really quickly again on the expansion of your crisis line um, and what has happened uh, in COVID during that? Yeah, um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to do that. But, um, you know, we've always operated uh, crisis intervention services, meaning uh, we have teams available to perform uh, mental health evaluations for individuals experiencing mental health emergencies and, uh, and uh, perform those assessments in a way that we can understand what level of care is needed, if they need to be admitted into a behavioral health unit, if those uh, individuals might need to be involved in our community-based crisis stabilization facilities or perhaps even be uh, referred to the Montana State Hospital. Uh, but I think across the entire state, certainly throughout our region right now, uh, we've identified a need to bring more specific resources to crisis services and that's something that we're really trying to build uh, and add uh, new types of services there. But recently um, throughout the COVID crisis and especially during the stay-at-home order, uh, we started to see a significant increase in case acuity. Uh, and uh, many individuals uh, who previously might have been seeking a therapeutic intervention well before experiencing that emergency are now waiting because they're isolating. They're reluctant to go into a care environment. Uh, so that, so they're, we're, we're seeing more people hit that point of mental health emergency. Uh, and, and our resources are starting to become taxed as a result of that. Uh, we're seeing a huge increase in that need. Uh, so we're trying to address it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat uh, that crisis line for your organization, just so everybody can see it. Thank you so much, Levi. Um, Dr. Potts, uh, same question to you. How has your organization adapted during the pandemic? What has been the biggest challenge for you and the most positive change? And then feel free to share your screen and a little more information with us. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Um, a lot of a lot of what I put in the slideshow. Um, oops. Yeah, a lot of a lot of what I wrote about um, in my slides. Also, um, I, I think just speaking to how creative we've been. Like Levi mentioned, you mentioned a lot of creativity that was needed. I I feel the same way within our organization too. So. I feel like we've adjusted together quite well as an organization. Um, we I have to use this too. Okay. So just to give you a background, we are a, a federally qualified health center in the Missoula County. We have seven sites throughout the county. And if anyone's listening who isn't super familiar with what an FQHC, what a federally qualified health center is, um, well, we've been around since the 60s. and our centers like ours, health centers, community centers like ours, were created kind of in an effort to work toward healthcare equality. So um, same same kind of time frame as Medicare and Medicaid. We were born in 1989, and so now just 31 years later, we serve over 16,000 patients and patients of all ages. Uh, in practice, I am a child psychologist. We have family medicine. Um, we have a pediatrician. So we we serve across the lifespan. We also have an academic training site, which I was really excited to partner with when coming here, too. Um, we have the Family Medicine Residency of Western Montana. Um, this residency is committed to developing family physicians who are compassionate, clinically competent, and motivated to serve patients and communities in the rural and underserved areas of Montana. So together, and I have to mention both pieces, we're a pretty awesome duo, if you ask me. And I've been proud to be here for just about eight months now. Uh, I feel like I got on board just in time for some ex 
excitement and a lot of change. So we have been creative in how we deliver healthcare. We absolutely had to transfer to telehealth. So I would say that's the biggest piece is we had fewer than 50 telehealth appointments. And now we have, as of May 31st, we have a lot more appointments now. But in our first telehealth survey, we had 6,538 appointments. So we transitioned that way. To me, it feels like overnight. Um, and it really, it really kind of was overnight. And I, I was thinking of uh, St. Patty's Day weekend as well. I was in Whitefish for a conference. I feel like I came back to work on Monday, March 16th, feeling like this is going to be a lot different. This is so different than anything I think I've ever experienced. Um, and I think it's true. So as far as other things, we've, we've definitely put our um, minds to together, training and supporting staff, making sure that people feel confident to deliver services over telehealth. Uh, with that, even making sure uh, patients know how to access telehealth. Um, and we've actually trained, kind of had, had brief training sessions for any patient who hasn't accessed our services over telehealth. So we do a brief visit with one of our patient service specialists just to make sure their Zoom is working, just to make sure we can see them, they can hear us, that kind of thing is working. And we had some really good feedback about that from our first telehealth survey that we sent out to our patients. There's a lot of change. Um, I feel like we've been we've been pretty pretty creative together. And something that also helped us work so well together so quickly was using an incident command model, um, so an ICS incident command structure model. I had never worked in this model before. Um, one of my colleagues, our director of operations, Abby Barrow, had said during that weekend, everyone needs to learn what ICS is. When we come back, let's operate in this framework. So we had an operations team, a planning team, admin, finance team, and logistics. And uh, Lori Francis, our CEO, actually operated kind of as in a team with a couple of individuals as the incident commander. This, oper this allowed us to operate in our own lanes. And so I feel like we got to, we got to um, attack so much at once because we were so um, organized in terms of what lanes we're swimming in, whose responsibility is what. We were still, still able to, to pilot um, new, new formats while also tending to patient care. Um, I'm proud of all the work we've done. And I'm, I feel closer with so many of my colleagues. Uh, I feel like I got to know people so quickly over the last few months. And being a new member of Partnership Health Center, um, I definitely I feel like there's no better way to get to know people except um, being under a lot of stress for a while. <laughs> I mentioned a couple of these policies. I don't have to go into detail with it now, but I, I do have to mention that we're able to do telehealth in all the ways that Levi mentioned as well because of the opportunities afforded to us right now. So we can see people in the same neighborhood, and that wouldn't have been possible before. So with our HIPAA waiver, our Montana Medicaid allowances, and also our expansions before I ever moved to Montana in 2015, um, and even with our CARES Act, we, we can deliver telehealth in such more flexibility. Um, Right now, we can deliver telehealth over phone. We can deliver telehealth over a video format. That might not always be the case. We're hoping it could be because a lot of people benefit from the phone option. Um, but we're, we, we definitely want telehealth to be an option moving forward. So I will, I will pause there. I don't know if there's a spot. I might share my, my slides again later. But we are passionate about providing a service that feels both good for patients and also feels like we're, we're making a difference um, on the staff side too. We have dedicated providers here who care about people in our community and um, we've definitely worked together a lot. Dr. Potts, uh, we're so um, grateful to have you on that team and it's just been wonderful to have you a part of partnership and our community in general. We're so glad that you moved back and became a part of our community. And, and I had mentioned before uh, our COAD task force, the mental behavioral um, task force that I personally worked on and, and is still ex in existence. COAD stands for the Community Organizations Active in Disasters. And we have representatives from all over our area that come together to really attend to the best needs um, in our community with the best practices. So thank you so much for that. Um, we're going to turn it over to Rob. Same question. Um, Mr. Watson, uh, how has your organization adapted during the pandemic? What has been the biggest challenge for you and the most positive changes? Uh, great, great questions. I would um, 
start by saying that what I've really appreciated about being a newcomer to Missoula has been the uh, coordination um, with local leaders and uh, feel really privileged to be a part of some of those discussions and some of those acronyms that were just mentioned. Um, I thought we had a lot of acronyms in education, but there's even more so in uh, um, incident command structure. So I, I have appreciated it. What I've really appreciated is uh, the opportunity to uh, bounce ideas off of or share things with our community leaders. I think that when we're all coordinated, it really does work better. Uh, while we may not always agree with each other, I think the coordination has been really, really helpful. So as a new uh, leader in the community, I've just really appreciated that opportunity. I, um, it, It's been very interesting for us, the entire experience, and I, I just wanted to share a couple of highlights and then also talk a little bit about what we learned um, from, from the process, which I think will answer the question. Um, so if I can advance my screen here. Hopefully uh, you'll see a picture of a bus. Um, and what I wanted to do is talk just a little bit about what we learned in remote learning. So just like everyone else, we, um, we went to a remote learning or a um, teleschool option in uh, the middle of our spring break. So that, that middle of March was our spring break and we um, went into uh, a school closure mode as, as um, ordered by the governor. So what I wanted to do is just share some facts and figures that happened during that time. So um, we, we gave out uh, or uh, handed out for students to borrow about 1,500 devices, um, computers that were needed by families to get access to the remote learning. Um, in addition, we found a, a fairly large um, uh, part of our population that needed a internet access. So we were able to secure some hotspots to provide that internet access for families. About 125 were given out. Um, and I know that's not a huge chunk of our population, but it was definitely needed by those kids and families to get access to the remote learning. We quickly transitioned with Beach Transportation's help. We transitioned to a lunch delivery model. Um, and what was um, really great about this model is we actually delivered to the neighborhoods. So we went to the bus stop. So where a kid would normally come to pick up the bus, they could come in the middle of the day to pick up um, to pick up a lunch and breakfast for the next day. And I will tell you that was accessed by many, many families. It was free for all kids. It didn't matter if they were um, Missoula County Public Schools kids or not. Any kid under the age of 18 had access to that. Uh, because of a grant through the um, federal lunch program, we were able to access, give access to any kid that needed it. And we had families come and get that um, throughout the entire closure, 57 days of lunch and breakfast. In that time, um, we served over 92,000 bags of food, and those bags included the lunch for the day and breakfast for the next day. So um, I really am um, uh, internally grateful for Beach Transportation for helping us get that done. I would tell you also our food service staff and the staff that were on the buses were uh, volunteer staff. We sent a, sent the word out and we quickly had people that wanted to do that work. Um, and we had staff that were committed to all 57 days of getting those lunches out. So really appreciate that help from those folks. We could have never got it done without them. Um, what we learned, so we're still learning uh, about what happened in remote learning, and I want to just reference a couple of um, national pieces of data that I've been reading about. Now, obviously, um, our students were in remote learning, and so we haven't really had a chance to meet with them again to assess what they learned and what they didn't learn in remote learning, but um, there have been some national studies on this, and I want to talk briefly about the learning loss that that did occur, um, <clears throat> not just here in Missoula, but across the nation. So what what you'll all recognize and probably already know is that we already experienced a little bit of learning loss over the summer months. So um, there's been a lot of national research on summer learning loss. And typically students lose about a month's worth of learning during the summertime. So the way that we the way that we measure that is when a student comes back in the fall, 
um, we can actually measure how how many days it will take for them to get caught up to where they were in the spring. And usually, depending on the student, it's anywhere from 30 days to 45 days. Uh, that that's the summer learning loss. What we're hearing and what we're they're predicting for the COVID uh, remote learning shutdown is um, three months worth of 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 loss um, for reading and five months worth of loss for math. And that again depends on the grade level and the age of the student. But generally speaking, as students are just starting out in kindergarten, first and second grade, they're just learning how to read. Um, if they don't have that continual practice in reading, then that's where the learning loss can be even worse. So we know that there will be some learning loss. And then the last thing that really makes this COVID experience kind of unique is that the decline will be at different rates. And the reason is, is because some students had better access or engaged more in the remote learning versus other students. And so we know that that when the students come back, there will be a um, vastly different um, population in terms of ability level at different rates. So that's one thing that we have learned from remote learning and the learning loss. And these are the, the way they determine these national studies is they look specifically at previous cases of learning loss. Like, for example, when Hurricane Katrina happened, there was a significant amount of learning loss in that part of the country as students couldn't couldn't go back to school. So that's how they they've done some of these predictability models. And this is what they expect um, when students come back at, at the national level. And then the other thing which is very relevant to our discussion today is we know that that this remote learning and the pandemic has had impacts on students mental health. Um, they're predicting for three reasons. Um, we're in the middle of a public health crisis, which is a traumatic event. Our ex students experience social isolation um, during the closure. And then obviously, um, possibly an economic recession, which also can have impacts on students' mental health. What I wanted to point out though, which I found very, very interesting is if you look across the country nationally, um, ab about, um, if you look at all the students nationally that receive um, mental health services, 57% of the students that do receive uh, mental health services receive them at the school in some in some form. So our schools are offering um, quite a bit of mental health services for students. And I just want to recognize that when we went into remote learning, some of obviously some of that continued through telehealth, but a lot of it um, students didn't have access to. Um, we also did two surveys, and I just want to talk briefly because I think this speaks to the stress that's out there in our community. We asked, we did a survey of our parents in uh, the first two weeks of June. Uh, we had a, uh, enough respond to the survey that we feel like it's a pretty good representative sample of our parents. Um, and I'm just going to go through a couple of highlights. 38% said that they were satisfied or very satisfied with remote learning. So that's a big chunk that, that obviously we're not. 46% uh, had reported high levels of stress with remote learning. Obviously, all of us when we are trying to work, but also have kids at home definitely is very stressful. 45% um, said that they have health and safety concerns with the return in the fall. But on the sort of on the flip side of that, 60% are confident that we'll be able to develop a plan for a healthy and safety re safe return. Um, and then 68% agree that, 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 that they do plan to send their kids back to school in August. And I know 68% sounds a little bit low, but about 25% of them said they were neutral at the time of the survey. So I think that those 25% are really kind of waiting to see what things look like in August. Um, but we have a high percentage of, I believe a high percentage of parents that do plan to send their students back in August. Um, and then we also surveyed our teachers and our classified staff um, during that first two weeks of June. And um, here's some of the stress related that we pulled out of that survey. 59% worry about the impact of COVID on their personal health. 53% uh, expressed a high level of anxiety. 45% were confident in a safe and healthy return, but again, a big percentage were neutral to that question. Um, and then 66% were confident that they could return in the fall. I want to talk also about what we what we learned and how it's kind of guiding our planning for the fall. Here is um, three things I know that we're going to be working on. Um, what we could do as educators when kids come back. 
we want to focus on relationships first. Um, I did mention this once during um, the remote learning that we are living through a traumatic event. And we know that trauma has impacts on not only on our work life, but it also has impacts on, on how students learn. Uh, we understand that better now than we ever have before, just about the impacts of trauma and trauma events. So we understand that when kids come back, they will, they will be still living through some of that trauma and it is going to impact their learning, not just for some kids, but for a large percentage of kids. So obviously that means focusing on relationships and frequent check-ins with students based on what we're seeing. We also know that kids are going to come back at different spots in terms of their education. And so what we really have to do that first um, several weeks of school is strengthen the diagnostic checks. That means more frequent checks for understanding of our students, making sure that we're checking to see how they're progressing and if they need extra support. And then that'll also help help us determine how much time we need to spend reviewing some material that they may have missed last spring. And then the last piece of their differentiate instruction is something that we've already done for a lot of years, but we need to do even more of it. And that basically means as a teacher, I know that kids are coming in at different levels and I sort of have to meet kids where they're at and carry them forward from that point. So that's differentiated instruction is not easy, but it's something that our, our teachers have some experience with already. And then the last thing I'll just point out is we obviously have a lot of questions about what fall looks like. It seems to change every day, if not every week, in terms of some of the guidance that we're receiving. The first week of July, we received guidance from the governor's office and from the Office of Public Instruction. The guidance was somewhat similar and somewhat different in terms of what we should be doing in the fall. Um, both of those pieces of guidance were based on guidance from the CDC. Uh, we also received some guidance from the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is just another source of information. Um, I appreciated the guidance that we received from the American Academy of Pediatrics because it was more specific um, with regards to certain things that we should be thinking about. But we're using all of that guidance to really plan for the fall. Uh, we haven't released anything formal yet, but we are starting to create some documents that will give folks an idea of what it might look like. But what I have learned is that we have to be very flexible and we're going to have to plan for multiple scenarios um, as as the case counts go up or the case counts go down or guidance or direction that we get from the local county health department. We're really going to have to be flexible. We are planning. Uh, this is new for us. We're planning a ramp up program for a select number of students. And these are students that we identified as students that really struggled in the spring. And we've invited those kids to come back a few work weeks early. Um, and we're gonna start that in August. And I think this will be really great because it'll help us define what, this, what the fall will look like and help us determine what works and what doesn't work with kids. So we're, we're planning that at every single school, elementary and middle school uh, ramp up program that includes our staff and some other key folks in the building. Um, pretty small programs, probably less than eight to 10 kids per teacher. Um, and it's just a, a two week trial basis for that ramp up. Um, we're putting a lot of health protocols in place, as you can imagine. Um, we're complying with the mask, the mask order that came out last week. We've already been doing that with some of our summer programs in place. Um, and then we also are looking at um, other precautions. The CDC and the, the governor and the state uh, office of public instruction have really encouraged us to limit sizes of groups, but also limit the mixing of groups. So we're trying to look at both of those scenarios. Um, I think we can bring students back in a full capacity, but we may have to limit the mixing of groups, which is easier at elementary and it's a little harder at middle school and high school. And then we're also limiting the visitors into the school. What we're hearing is that the transmission between adults seems to be a lot more prevalent than the transmission between kids. So we wanna limit the adult visitors in the schools during this first phase. Um, if there is a confirmed case in school, we expect there will be a short-term closure, could be two to five days to allow for uh, the health department to do some contact tracing. We will offer a remote learning option for any of those students who cannot attend. Um, we know that that's important that they still have options for education, so we're working on that as well. And then the last thing I already mentioned, we're, we know we're gonna have to be very flexible and adaptable uh, because things will look a lot different in the fall. So to be specific, I mean, I think um, we're still waiting for guidance from the Missoula County Health Department, but 
what we're hoping for is um, everyday instruction for every student, uh, but we are really looking at the schedule. It may be a shortened schedule in some situations, or we may alter the, the rotation of the schedule. So at middle school and high school, you know that our students rotate between classes and we may, we may limit that. So students are only mixing with a couple of different groups per day, just in order to get the mixing of groups down. Um, we obviously are, we can't social distance in a lot of our classrooms. Our classrooms are just not big enough to socially distance. So what we're probably gonna end up doing is focusing on other risk mitigation strategies like the use of masks in the classroom so that we're limiting the transmission. And then as I mentioned before, just limiting the mixing of groups. We know that recess is gonna look different. Lunchtime is gonna look different. After school activities are gonna look different. We just don't know exactly what those will look like yet as we're still working through some of those plans and waiting from guidance from the health department and also sort of watching to see what happens with the spread of the community spread of, of COVID. Thank so I think so that much, sort of answers most of it. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and we all know that during this time of civil unrest and the COVID, we often have more questions right now than we do have answers, but we are united in finding creative solutions. I'm going to pass it back to Susan Haypatrick to say a few more words and introduce our question and answer section. Thanks, everybody. Uh, really very, very interesting, thought-provoking conversation, and we really appreciate it. Uh, those of you who are regulars at City Club know that Q&A is a very rich part of every City Club forum. So please uh, use the Q&A function, not the chat, the Q&A to type in your questions. I encourage you to not be anonymous, but to uh, have the courage of your convictions. Two of our board members will forward them to Rosie to pose to our panel. Uh, it's often unlikely that all questions can be answered uh, due to time limitations, but we will, uh, you know, we'll do the best that we can to get through them. Uh, we are looking for questions, not position statements, but succinct civil questions. And if you're here representing the media, please wait to ask your questions uh, until uh, after the forum. We're happy to connect you with our panelists. So um, I think that Brett and Peggy, are, are two of our City Club board members, have been uh, taking a look at the questions and, and sending them on to Rosie. So let the Q&A begin. Thank you, Susan. Uh, yeah, we've already had quite a few questions, so I'm going to try to condense a few of them that are similar and make sure that we give everybody an opportunity um, to share. And I'll continue to look at those questions as they come in. So thank you guys for continuing to respond with your questions. Um, one of the uh, uh, several of the questions that we've gotten already are about the trauma impact of this pandemic. Um, as it relates to people's ability to learn and um, even perform tasks within your organizations. Uh, so what, um, what, what we want to know is how are you preparing for the mental health consequences of the projected effects of COVID-19, both on your clients, your students, and your employees in your organization? Is there anything that you're doing to encourage um, you know, mental health and uh, and how does that trauma, how do you anticipate the trauma affecting people in your organizations? Um, and who would like to start? That's a question for all of our panelists. I could start with that. Thank you, Sarah. So we, I, I think this whole time have wanted to have as much consistency and um, room for, for building real, like reliable expectations for our staff and also maintaining all of our services as much as we would all, although they are over telehealth. So we're, we're maintaining all of our groups. Um, they are meeting over telehealth. We're adding more group options uh, for youth and for adults. As far as our staff, we're wanting to have as much choice as we can. So we can't, we can't choose a lot of what's happening right now, but if we have a little bit more room for making choices of how we work, where we work, um, if we identify in the high risk category, are we going to be safe working in the workspace? Those are all considerations that we're encouraging all supervisors and staff to, to talk about. Um, 
we do have a system right now for anybody who may identify in a high risk category. We're trying to keep as many people um, working as, as typically as they would. And so I feel like there's a lot of flexibility and we're being very creative in terms of having people work in maybe different capacities. Maybe, maybe somebody who identifies in a high risk category, they may not be in the same patient facing role as they may have been before, but because of our opportunities in telehealth, we also have different roles and different areas that need support that we didn't before. So we're, we're trying to maintain as much consistency and also trying to, to get back to a more um, structure um, that people can rely on in the work setting. You were muted, Eva, Rosie, you're... I got it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, very, very similar to what Sarah was saying. I think um, from my perspective, operationally, it's it's uh, perhaps easier to understand how we can enhance access for clients and individuals who may need services, uh, behavioral health services or mental health services. Um, so we put a lot of effort into uh, identifying ways and operationalizing ways to improve access to our services. I think our commitment to same day access really uh, um, captures that effort. Uh, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're providing care when it's needed rather than looking at uh, trying to schedule an appointment for two weeks from now. Uh, you know, that's not effective for somebody who, who identifies that they need assistance today. Um, so our commitment to that same day access has been really important. Uh, but I am willing to admit that it is frequently challenging uh, from the staff side, looking at how we can help our staff understand uh, what their work-life balance needs to be. How do they self-identify in um, the, the idea that they're experiencing an undue level of stress or a heightened level of stress? And then beyond the identification, how do we encourage them to seek uh, some stress relief and some self-care options? So um, those are things that we work on every day. I think uh, communication is a big part of that. And I mentioned that in my slideshow, the idea of sending emails to our staff, checking with our staff, having our leadership group check in with staff on a regular basis and provide different resources, uh, whether it's through the CDC website, uh, the Montana Department of Health and Human Services has a great website with a lot of different options for self-care and stress relief. So we try to encourage uh, the use of those resources as best we can. Thank you, Levi. Uh, and Rob, um, a little specific uh, about that particular question for you. Um, one of our attendees uh, noticed that you had mentioned about taking respite over the summer and encouraging your teachers to do so as well. Is there anything they wondered um, that you are doing to make respite more accessible to your staff? And, uh, you know, whether it's providing pay increases or lobbying the state or government for funding to support the students, um, and how are you reimagining what uh, supporting mental health with students and your um, employees looks like over this next coming year? Big question. Yeah, a, that is a, an excellent question. I would tell you that <clears throat> mental health services for our staff um, is something that we were actually looking at pre-COVID. Um, this last year was our first year in our district that we launched an employee assistance program that provides uh, free counseling. I think it's up to three to five sessions of free counseling for any staff member. And that was all pre-COVID. That's something that we found was very useful this last year. It's anonymous. It's confidential. Um, our staff is accessing it. Um, so that's something we will continue. Um, as, far as, as far as our students, um, I think one of the things that made me most nervous in, in the remote learning part of our um, environment was we didn't have that opportunity for frequent check-ins. It's so much easier to check in with a student when they're in your classroom every day or every other day. So that was that was really scary for us. We did the best we could to check in with as many kids as we could, but quite honestly, I know that there were some kids that fell through the cracks, not just academically, but also for their just mental health support and social isolation. So that's something that we will have to do a better job with this fall. if. If we are in a remote learning situation, we'll have to figure out ways to develop that system so that we don't have any kids that fall through the cracks. Thank you, Rob. Um, and I have been a Spark theater teaching artist um, through the dis with the district for 
quite a few years now, and I was quite impressed that uh, not only was Spark offering videos about social emotional learning and isolation, and those videos are still up, um, they were offering interactions individually with kids. Uh, artists around the community were really pooling to try to find creative ways to support teachers as well. They were doing mindfulness activities and groups with teachers, especially in the beginning of COVID, to help them to be able to focus and, and put their own oxygen mask on first to be able to help the kids. So there's a lot of creative solutions out there. And um, well, our next question uh, comes from... Ooh, let me see just move my screen here, from William Lawrence. Uh, he says, I work with an organization whose members are, are seniors who live independently and some are shut in with limited technology support. What services are available to a senior who is shut in or, or who just needs someone to talk to? I'd be happy to talk about that too. So I hope, William, that you don't already work with Mozilla Aging Services. And maybe you do, <laughs> but in the, in the instance that you don't, Missoula Aging Services is here in Missoula, and they have a plethora of support services for seniors around Missoula, actually in the whole county. Um, we've actually partnered with Missoula Aging to serve um, outside of the city of Missoula. We have a lot of uh, patients who live in the Sealy area. Um, one neat, they have a lot of neat programs, but one neat program they have is Meals on Wheels. And this is an opportunity for individuals who may not have the accessibility to get outside the house to go get groceries or um, even, you know, connect. You know, with their uh, all the other opportunities they offer. Next question. Um, we've had several about the uh, social connection being a major element um, as far as our mental health goes and our social connection, how it's been curtailed or altered in a multitude of ways. And um, how can people, especially students and children, and uh, those identifying as LGBTQ plus still find connection and interaction with their peer groups during this time. It, um, you know, I'll, I'll start. I, I'm sure others have some comments as well, but I think um, you know that has been a challenge that we've identified. Rob mentioned it, uh, but just the idea of maintaining engagement, especially in youth populations, and how to get them connected to friends and uh, ensure that they have an outlet uh, and an ability to maintain those connections. And I, I think uh, some of our services that are, are focused on youth and adolescents. Uh, again, the creativity seems to be a common theme, but uh, really uh, we've been working to engage them in smaller uh, groups, uh, trying to maintain social distancing, uh, typically in outdoor environments, uh, you know, providing masks and PPE to ensure that we're doing the best we can to limit exposure or risk of transmission. Um, but, but I think there are ways to do that, uh, especially in an outdoor environment. Uh, to to uh, be connected and uh, as as simple as uh, taking a couple kids and going on a walk and and having conversations and trying to engage and allow them to um, you know have some type of therapeutic interaction. Uh, as far as uh, kids that are not a part of our programming, I think uh, parents could uh, also take the same approach. And, you know, I speak from my own personal experience with trying to uh, have my kids maintain their, their personal connections with friends and how to do that appropriately and safely. So uh, I, I do think that there are ways to encourage that. Uh, typically, uh, I've found the most success in outdoor environments. Are there any other platforms or strategies that we can talk about in helping um, children to uh, connect with their peer group and particularly LGBTQ uh, plus um, students? The first one that had come to mind for me was the Project Tomorrow always works with uh, the Trevor Project nationally and Tamarack um, 
uh, Grief Resource Center here in town has been creating a lot of new platforms and groups and looking into those connections. They work with the Missoula County Public Schools and the counselors in those offices as well to provide new and interesting services. As well as many of, um, we were talking a little bit about the arts organizations in town. Um, but we do know that that face-to-face -face contact or one-on-one, -on -one, even on Zoom, uh, is much more useful than just passively um, getting videos as well. Sarah, you had perhaps a response to that? I love the Trevor Project, and I actually wrote that in a little blurb here to send to you. I'll just send to you here, and you can share it with anybody if they're interested. I do recommend checking that out. Um, I wish we had a group for, for teenagers here at Partnership, and, and we don't have that. Um, I have a lot of to-do items on my list. I've only been here eight months, but I think that'd be a great resource in the community. It might be really neat to partner with schools, too. Rob, so maybe we should talk about that. Um, but I also like to think that just because we're socially distancing doesn't mean we're in isolation. So like you mentioned, Rosie, using screens, getting involved, hanging out with people in ways that are safe, it's so important to to get out there and do that in, in whatever way is safe and available. Um, but just because we're social distancing doesn't mean we're in isolation. Rosie, you're going to have to unmute. Very much. All right. Um, and another question, um, a follow-up to the survey, Rob, that you prov provided some answers for. That survey, uh, one of the attendees asked that this survey was sent out prior to recent resurgence of COVID in Missoula. Does MCPS have a plan on resurveying families and teachers? We do. Yep. Um, so I, I mentioned a couple of different times in that survey where we got a lot of neutral um, and that's completely understandable that survey went out you know right at the beginning of summer and we still had a lot of unknowns and there will continue to be unknowns so um, the other thing I think people were kind of waiting for is to like to see what exactly our plan might look like for the reopening we have a couple now more firmed up scenarios of what that might look like for the reopening and so once we get those out to the general public and they have a chance to ask questions about those we'll send a follow-up survey for both staff and parents. Thank you, Ram. Uh, Faith Price asked, on top of the stress and trauma of COVID, systematic racism has come to the forefront as contributing to disparities in the pandemic, overall health, education, justice system, et cetera. How is your organ organization addressing systematic racism currently? I can speak to that. Uh, we we already have at the forefront of our mission as an organization that we honor and respect all people, and that all people are welcome at our at our health center. Um, internally, we are doing more cultural, cross cultural, multicultural training for for all staff, um, and these are also initiatives that were already on our radar, and I think should be on our radar for forever. Uh, I, I would just I would just echo that we also had and continue to have a fairly robust uh, non-discrimination um, uh, policy in our in our school district policy. It's based on the fact that all students doesn't matter what your background is. Um, all students have an opportunity and equal access to high quality education, and that's something that we again recommitted ourselves and reminded our board of trustees about that policy and and our staff recently but really the question i think really gets to the systematic piece of that and and what i'm convinced is that there is systematic racism and i'm also committed to figuring out what we can do to change that in our own organization now what i will tell you is that the more that i listen to students the more i learn um, and I, I, I'm committed to listening to students on this issue because, um, quite frankly, I believe I understand what some of the issues are, but I have not experienced our system through the eyes of our students. And I don't believe I can really fully understand what it is until I talk to them. 
So that's something that I'm committed to, to do this fall is, is take time and an opportunity in an organized fashion to really hear from our students regarding that issue of systematic racism because I think I know what it is, but I haven't, I haven't experienced it through their eyes. I'd like to add one more piece if I can, if that's okay. Um, we also believe that healthcare isn't just about blood pressure and numbers on a scale. Like health, health is so much more broad than that. So just thinking of all this, um, the social determinants of health that are at play. Um, we have a wraparound set of services and we also believe in strong connections in our community. So we have social work, we have behavioral health. Um, we're working to get a medical legal partnership here at our health center. Um, but we do believe that it's, it's more about connecting and coordinating with the larger community to increase the overall health of our, of our um, community. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, um, I, I would echo some of the comments that were already made and then um, say from the perspective of Western Montana Mental Health Center, uh, being a community behavioral health provider that typically deals with um, high acuity needs and uh, uh, seriously disabling mental illness, our agency is, uh, is well accustomed to representing and advocating for marginalized or underrepresented populations. And I, I feel like the issue of uh, racial injustice and social injustice um, really is something that we as an agency can, uh, can have more prominent in our conversation. Uh, even though we're very accustomed to advocating uh, I think we can expand that conversation to include some some other underrepresented uh, groups. Thank you, Lila. And I know that um, as well for Project Tomorrow, we've been looking at the idea of health equity for a while now, and in particular, how even our statistics are gathered and reported. And uh, we are lucky enough to have on our board several members from different um, organizations. And in particular, we've been working with All Nations Health Center to talk about health equity and how we are gathering and even reporting suicide in Montana, how those how those things have been gathered, but, um, but also how we're attacking the problem in new and, and uh, creative ways. Um, our next question is from Sylvia Roma. I know that for addicts, Group meetings are an integral part of recovery. I assume that many of these types of meetings have been moved to virtual meetings. However, I'm curious how you are reaching folks who are falling into substance abuse behaviors in light of the pandemic. Are virtual meetings effective for these folks where, uh, where they didn't already have an in-person connection to the people with whom they were meeting? So I would say uh, from our perspective, we absolutely uh, did the best we could with the technology uh, to ensure that there was a constant connection. And we did use uh, our telehealth platform to provide group meetings specific for substance use disorder because that is such a critical component um, to, to those in recovery. Uh, but I think we, it's, uh, it would uh, not be truthful if we didn't acknowledge that the face-to-face the -face connection, uh, in-person connection is also a significant component of that. Um, so we've uh, re-engaged some of those group uh, therapeutic interactions in person uh, to maintain social, di social, social distancing with masks and, and appropriate precautions in place. But um, the, the substance, uh, those in recovery from substance abuse uh, do benefit from that in-person interaction uh, more so than what we've seen uh, in the uh, telehealth setting. And we do, um, they do have a full list of online virtual meetings uh, with aa-montana.org, uh, alanonmontana.org uh, as well. And um, I do believe that even uh, Narcotics Anonymous has an online uh, platform to be able to access their online meetings. And all of those organizations have their 800 numbers and crisis numbers where you can connect personally to another peer support member. I also think it's a challenge that we all trans transition to telehealth so quickly. I think if there wasn't a crisis, we would have, we would have all gone, I mean, telehealth was also in our, um, I guess on our docket of, of things to expand with as well, but we would have done it a little differently, right? Like we wouldn't have done it overnight. And so I think we would have taken the time to triage which groups would be best to have in person, which groups would be best to have over telehealth. 
I know we're also not perfect in that either. And um, we have a lot of room to grow and that we did this overnight. And now we're thinking, okay, maybe certain groups, just like certain medical diagnoses or medical um, complaints are better in person. Maybe the same cases with, with behavioral health, with mental health too. Um, all right. Uh, looks like Ethel McDonald has asked, um, Rob, are there any plans uh, to increase nursing and counseling staff with MCPS? Yes. Um, I would tell you that um, <clears throat> one of the things that we've had luck with is hiring health aides. Um, we, we haven't had a whole lot of luck with finding nurses, quite frankly, because of the pay. Um, nurses generally can make more money outside in the um, public or in the private sector. So, but we do have a we do have quite a few nursing staff already. But again, um, what, we're, what we're trying to trying to lean towards or, or direct our our resources are towards health aides, and health aides would provide those um, checks for kids um, in this during the school day for health screening checks. So that's one area. the The counseling piece is a very interesting piece. We continue to look at that every year. It's become a statewide discussion, and so I would encourage folks to get involved in this at the legislative level. I will be involved in it, involved in this in the next legislative session. But right now, the state standards um, um, require uh, one counselor for every 400 students, and we know that's not enough. Um, but unfortunately, that's that's what the that's what we're budgeted for, and so. Um, we try to make that money stretch as much as possible, but this really becomes a state issue. The national standards on school counseling are, are one counselor for every 250 students, which I know also sounds like a lot, but if we can get closer to that ratio, then I, I believe we can obviously help more students. So um, that's something I know will be discussed at the Board of Public Ed and probably eventually at the legislative, uh, at the legislature next legislative session. So as you see those um, discussions around school counseling, please get involved in those. We could use your help. Thank you so much. There's a few questions around parents um, and how the parents in our community can support their children at this time, uh, both with their learning and mental health, um, but especially parents who are working full time. How can parents find support as they have to figure out utilizing um, child care or their own stresses as a parent? I can, I can speak to this. I, I bet we all have some ideas on, on parents and, and um, supports at this time. Um, I think one of the biggest things to think about is when we have awareness for what is going on and how that could impact not only our kids but ourselves. That's it's kind of a, it's a really big piece. So I would say parents who are worried, parents who are concerned, the fact that you're concerned, the fact that you're worried, the fact that you're aware is huge. Um, we actually look at awareness as a strong mediator in terms of outcome and, and, and child progress and treatment. Um, another piece to think about is structure. Yes, things are different. How can we still have some structure embedded in um, a routine throughout the day or parts of a routine? Another piece to think about is make it count where you can. So it might look different. Your time together may be different. But when you have that ability to have even five minutes of one-on-one -on -one time with your little one, your teenager, make it count for what it is. Join them in what they're doing. Get involved with what they might be excited about or interested about. Um, we can use all of those opportunities as ways to increase just not only our relationship, but also their independence and make sure kids and teenagers know how well they're doing, managing all the stuff that's getting thrown at them right now. Thank you, Dr. Pat. I know my entire family is playing Pokemon Go. I know more about Pokemon Go than I ever could have imagined. And Naruto and Avatar the Last Airbender. So if you have any questions, call me. House full. We also have a lot of resources on our Partnership Health Center website, too. So that's partnershiphealthcenter.com. We have just um, two more quick questions that I think we can get through. Uh, and I know we, we can't get through everything today um, or solve all the world's problems, but I think we're making a good beginning. Uh, a couple of the questions had to do um, 
with uh, Rob. They wanted to know a little bit more about remote learning for those who can't attend or have significantly documented issue or students who are choosing not to attend. And I know we don't have all the answers about this either, but what do attendance requirements look like under COVID? Yeah, we're really hoping for flexibility from the state regarding our, our instructional minutes. We, ha we, got that reflex we got that flexibility during remote learning and we expect, expect we will get that this fall as well from the state of Montana. So as you're probably aware, I mean, our funding is tied to our instructional minutes and the number of kids that are enrolled in our district. Um, but we also know that kids learn differently at different rates. So we were allowed, we asked for, and we were allowed to, um, to, to look at that differently during remote learning. And we're hoping to do the same this fall. Uh, we will offer a remote learning option for any kids that can't come back. Um, it um, will likely be very similar to the remote learning that we provided this last spring. However, we've you know obviously made some tweaks and gotten better at it. But um, there will be teachers facilitating that remote learning, but it may not be the regular classroom teacher. We also suspect that we'll have some classroom teachers that can't go back to work full time, and so we're hoping to pair those teachers up with students that are on remote learning. So the content will be provided, and then the teacher will be there to facilitate the students in their you know in their path towards achieving uh, the content um, so we'll have that option for families um, i hope that families understand that we we don't want families to think that they won't have any options in the fall but uh, we'll allow for those kids that that want to continue in remote learning to do so what's been very clear to me and i, I just want to be clear with our community as well i can't ask a classroom teacher to do both i can't it's very difficult to do classroom teaching and remote teaching at the exact same time. So um, what we're trying to do is utilize our resources, the limited resources we have, and utilize those classroom teachers who can't come back to work as our remote learning teachers. Thank you, Ram. Um, and we have uh, one more question um, really quickly. Can we, uh, Carol Roberts writes, can we get a one word answer from each organization on which technology platform you are using for confidential groups? Is it Zoom or Doxy, et cetera? Our district, use, our district uses Google Meets. We're currently using Zoom and we're also exploring different options within our EMR. I would say uh, we're using Zoom, but I do want to clarify that there's a difference between the publicly available Zoom and the, the Zoom healthcare platform, which is dually encrypted. And that's what we use. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> uh, as we wrap up, is there anything you want to say, uh, given what we're living through at this moment? Is there one last idea that you want to part um, with today, let everybody have as we settle in for the end? We'll start with Levi. How about that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, so I guess parting thought for me, especially as it relates to mental health and behavioral health, and uh, understanding what we're uh, what we think is is going to be an increased need for those services, um, I, I would just urge compassion. I guess I think um, understanding that everyone in this time is experiencing different challenges that they've never faced before, whether it's professionally or personally, family related. Um, I think uh, the best thing that we can do for each other and for our community is really to be compassionate about uh, what everyone else is experiencing and then also uh, cut ourselves some slack. Uh, you know, we, we're also experiencing all of these things individually. So um, I, I think it's appropriate to just say uh, increase compassion towards everyone, including yourself. Sarah? I'm going to pull a quote from the last part of our telehealth survey that I didn't really talk about, but we had really we had surprisingly good outcomes and, and reports from patients who are accessing our telehealth services. There was one quote that really stuck out to me, and it is, I'm thankful telehealth is an option, but to be honest, I'm experiencing a lot of online meeting fatigue right now. And I appreciated this comment. All of us are on this meeting right now. I know we're online, we're very attentive, we're all having our screens on, but it is a different way of working. And we're in a new time and none of us have done it before. We don't even have data um, on, on how much this, this Zoom interaction or video interaction 
um, you know, ex our bodies experience it over time. So I, I think just being mindful of where you're at, maybe even if there's like a dose of, of screen that you might be feeling kind of over, um, step away from your computer when you can. Step away from your work when you can. Practice that. Model that for your staff. Model that for your families. Um, and, and don't be afraid to not take on more when you when you do have options. So I guess similar to what Levi said too. Practice practice some good boundaries. Pa practice some awareness of yourself. Um, and I always speak to quali quality over quantity. So I, I may I may be able to to spend thirty minutes taking care of myself in some way. Maybe I practice yoga. Maybe I go for a hike. Um, it, it matters that it happens. It doesn't matter as much how long maybe I spend doing those exercises, but it's that I take care of myself. Great. Thank you. All right, Rob, you got 30 seconds. <laughs> I won't even take that long. Remember what I said, flexibility and adaptability. I think those are really key um, and, 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 uh, and maintaining a positive attitude. Thank you guys so much for allowing me to be here and be of service with you today. Susan, I pass it back to you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, panelists and audience. Um, I, I do want to say that I, I did. I encourage people to not be anonymous, and, and somebody commented that they, he or she was choosing to remain anonymous uh, due to his or her professional affiliation, and, and I totally get that. Um, in my day job as CEO of United Way, sometimes Susan's position on an issue are mistaken for United Way's position on an issue, and United Way, of course, is Switzerland on many issues. Uh, so I, I would only say that we, in this Zoom format, we do try to stick as closely as possible to our regular format where, you know, we come together in person and we build bridges and uh, engage in civil discourse. So um, I apologize. To that person. I, I don't think you're a coward. I was just trying to stick with our regular format, but I, I definitely get it. Um, this was really eye-opening for me in a lot of ways, and I think you all revealed in a very eloquent way uh, that showed us how lucky we are to have each of you in your leadership roles, the opportunities and challenges that COVID-19 has brought. Uh, I do like to focus on the opportunity side, that, and, and I hope that all of our attendees paid attention to those opportunities for policy advocacy uh, and systems change that we heard about the need for today, the kind that moves a community forward from, you know, charity and emergency response to a system that promotes equity and justice, and I think that's what we're all looking for. So thank you all for your great questions and our panelists for their great presentations. Um